then let's get started. Uh, I'm obviously not Professor Hennig. My name is Marvin. Hi. I'm one of the PhD students in Professor Hennig's group, um, mostly researching probabilistic numerical methods for partial differential equations. And I'm glad to be able to give you today's lecture on the role of linear algebra in GPs. Um, so after the last lecture, feedback was a bit, uh, I guess, it felt a bit frightened. Don't worry, guys. I know last week's lecture was a lot to me. When I heard, first heard all of this stuff, it was a lot too. You get used to it. Those of you that actually uh, are interested in this sort of stuff, please keep pushing. Look into all of these topics if you're interested. Um, super interesting stuff. If you're not, it's also fine. It's completely fine. You're going to be good probabilistic machine learning engineers without knowing, knowing all of this stuff. It's just, you know, so you know where to look, essentially. Um, before starting with um, completely new stuff, let's just have a few slides recapping what happened last week. So firstly, we saw that um, Gaussian processes, as kind of suspected over the course of the previous lectures, are indeed probability distributions on function spaces, on functions. Um, we've seen that this, these spaces uh, need some care uh, when constructing them, but so far, so good. We've seen that these objects, these probability measures on function spaces, have what's called a covariance function. And that covariance function is actually a kernel in the sense that it's a positive definite function. And the other way around, we've seen that every kernel that you might see in, for example, statistical machine learning actually defines a Gaussian process with that kernel as set covariance function. Um, we've seen that kernels have eigenfunctions, just like matrices have eigenvectors. And in this sense, you can actu actually think of them as a kind of like infinite matrix that spans this function space, or a function space, rather. Um, and this function space is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, um, which are, you're going to hear a lot about in statistical machine learning also, I'm, I, I bet. Um, and the relationship of that space to the Gaussian process is that it's essentially the space of all possible posterior mean functions of a given Gaussian process. Um, we've also seen how the two frameworks relate by essentially saying that the posterior covariance function is um, related to a worst case error bound that people in statistical machine learning give in the frequentist uh, framework, I guess, which Bayesians, however, treat as their average square error. So in a sense, we're a bit more, if you will, conservative. Um, and lastly, and this was maybe a bit ru rushed in uh, last week's lecture, we've seen that the samples from this Gaussian process, so if we, we draw a function from that probability measure, that these actually do not lie in the RKHS of the kernel. And there was actually a very good question about that uh, in the feedback, which is, why does it even matter? Why, why would I care whether the samples actually lie in the, in the RKHS or not? One, one question, and the other one was, it seems that because essentially with the Gaussian, right, these, these functions, these sample functions kind of concentrate around the, the, mean, the posterior mean function or rather the mean function of the Gaussian process. And so aren't they actually in the RKHS anyways? Um, but maybe let's start with the second question, um, which is that just because two functions are close in value everywhere does not mean that they have to be close in a norm, which is or in any norm, rather, because, because that's essentially what we use to measure distance or similarity, if you will, between two functions. Um, maybe to illustrate this, let me draw a quick picture. Um, so assume that we have some, maybe like a constant mean function of a Gaussian process somewhere. So let's make some axes here. Let's assume this is zero for now. And then, we can call that maybe, I don't know, like f. Um, and then we can have a second function, g, that is just offset by a value of like 1. So the pointwise distance between these two functions is always 1. This is essentially this, uh, can you see the curve there? Actually, oh, crap. One sec. So this is essentially saying that this distance 
epsilon is one, or actually uh, smaller equal one in this case, uh, for all points in the, uh, the domain of the function. Um, now, this is, th this, th as I said, this uh, measures pointwise distance of two functions, but then there is norms um, that, that are supposed to um, measure the length and obviously then also the distance of two functions, um, which don't just compare the value of a function. Um, you could write that something like the supremum over all x in the domain of the absolute value of the function. In this norm, these two functions would also have a distance of one, right? Because the largest pointwise deviation is also one. But there's norms that, that actually um, combine um, essentially the, the, the deviation in value and the deviation in the derivative, which makes some sense, for example, if you want to measure smoothness. So you want to encourage smoothness in your solution as a regularizer, for example. Um, so then we essentially have this added on top of it. And I can essentially construct a function, for example, something like a Gaussian. So assume that this is actually zero, then we could like superimpose a Gaussian here. And that Gaussian is going to have a parameter, right? It's going to have the, the standard deviation as its parameter. Um, because this is one, I'm omitting the normalization constant, right? If you omit the normalization constant of a Gaussian, it's at its maximum value always one, so that's fine. But if I now decrease the standard deviation parameter, the derivative of one of these points is essentially going to be unbounded. It's going to be essentially as steep as I want it to be, which also means that this norm is going to be potentially much larger than one. So we can have two functions, which are sort of at most pointwise distance one away from each other, which, however, in some other norm, are essentially arbitrarily far from one another. And this is essentially what's happening here. Even though the, the samples are quite close to the mean function pointwise, they're not necessarily in the norm of the sample space, if there is such a, such a thing. Um, so let me, just to point that out here, that's for the second question. And then um, we, we essentially mentioned that these, these samples can lie outside of the RKHS because there's one very important case in which they are actually inside the RKHS, which is if the RKHS is finite dimensional. So for the feature construction of a Gaussian process where you explicitly give a finite set of features, there you can quite easily actually see that the samples lie in that space spanned by the kernel, by the parametric kernel, if you will. But as soon as the RKHS is infinite dimensional, samples will not lie in the RKHS with probability one, or phrased the other way around, the probability that a sample path from a GP is actually an element of the RKHS is zero. Now again, why should you care? Um, and the answer is, and that, that we actually didn't show yet, um, is that, well, maybe two points. First of all, there's real smoothness differences between these samples and the RKHS itself. So in the sense that functions in the RKHS are more often differentiable for some kernels than the sample paths are. And you might care about that if you, for example, want to use Gaussian processes for Bayesian optimization, where you want to be able to differentiate the process because, well, you have derivative observations, for example. So if you want to work with derivatives of a Gaussian process, it needs to be differentiable. And here's a good point for why, sh why you should care about the sample space then. And the other thing is we're Bayesians, right? The object we actually care about is not necessarily the posterior mean. The posterior mean is just something that summarizes the main object of interest, namely the posterior distribution, right? And if essentially the function we want to learn does not lie or the measure we, we're, we're positing does not give mass to the space in which the function we want to learn lies. That doesn't re really make any sense in a Bayesian framework, does it? So this is why, as Bayesians, we should actually care, I would argue, more about the sample space than just the RKHS of the kernel. Um, and let's actually get to some, some um, maybe, I guess, more practical thing here, um, looking at some applications where, where, where that might be. Um, worthwhile. Um, so in general, it's 
pretty difficult to actually talk about, like, there's a question? The question is, I guess, how you measure close, right? Yeah. This is one of, the, one of these reasons. So this is coming back to this point-wise deviation versus norm-wise deviation, maybe. The other thing is that the RKHS is, in a sense, small compared to the sample space. Because if you think about a linear subspace, like in, just in finite dimensional Gaussian distributions, a, a linear subspace that does not have um, sort of full um, full dimensionality in, 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 a in, a, in, a, in a given vector space also has measure zero under a given Gaussian measure, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, I guess, kind of think of the RKH as being lower dimensional, but that's quite difficult to quantify because we're working with infinite dimensional spaces. So one, it seems that one infinity is sort of larger than the other, but that's not actually the case. So this is maybe an intuition that helps there. Can you speak up a bit? Sorry. Yeah, but it's not, it's not as simple as saying the kernel needs to be differentiable or something. It's a bit more than that, right? It's, It's, it, obviously, it, it, it comes back to a property of the kernel because the kernel actually uniquely identifies a Gaussian process, so it kind of has to reduce to that. Right? There is theorems about that. I, maybe let's take this offline, then, then we talk about it later. Um, okay, so it's, it's a bit difficult to actually talk about the sample space of a GP. If there's one that sort of all GPs share, then it's, and you saw that last week by essentially the Komogorov extension theorem, it's the space of all functions from X to R, which is a bit useless because it's very, very ill-behaved and, and not really useless and uh, useful in practice. Um, but what one typically does is one, one finds an intermediate space um, sort of that lies sort of around the RKHS that contains all samples from the GP as a set, and then it's helpful to associate additional structure with this, which is typically that, you, that, that we're talking about a Banach space, so a, essentially a norm space um, that is complete with respect to the norm, so let's not worry about that detail too much. So we're, in a sense, hallucinating additional structure that isn't there because it's mathematically appropriate, one argument, and the other one is that in applications, we op often know functions to lie in a certain Banach space. Um, which, is, which is also quite useful. Um, and this is also quite a practical thing, actually, because if you know something about your function, for example, you know that your function needs to be at least once differentiable, then it makes sense to place your, your me measure, essentially, your, your, your measure over the function space on a space which actually has functions that are sufficiently often differentiable, because you can learn faster, right? If, if you can rule out hypotheses that aren't differentiable, then you need to sort of rule out less hypotheses, obviously, which, is, which means that you can, you can more efficiently handle the data that you have because you put in more prior knowledge about the problem. Um, and sometimes, well, for example, because certain transformations are only defined on certain subsets of functions, for example, the differentiable functions, you need to actually do that in order for the differential or the differentiation of a Gaussian process to make sense. Integration is kind of the same argument. Um, just some examples. So I already told you that Rx is, can be considered a sample space of the GP. It's too large for practical use because you actually don't really learn anything if, you're, if you assume your function lies in that space. Good luck. Um, the sort of next maybe smaller space that is still uh, quite ubiquitous and useful, and actually most of the samples um, from these standard non-parametric kernels that you've seen, you know, uh, square exponential, Wiener process, uh, all of these actually are at least typically continuous, so you can take the Banach space of continuous functions, um, which is 
maybe one of the sort of least assumptions you typically want to make. Um, the Banach space of k times continuously differentiable functions is, for example, useful, as I said, if you, if you work in Bayesian optimization, where sometimes you have derivative observations and then k is kind of set to 1, typically. Question? Uh, you have a norm on the space, so it's a vector space that has a norm, and it's complete with respect to the norm, which means that all Cauchy sequences converge in the space, but that's not super important. You can also look that up. Yeah. So, so um, you can show that. Um, so there is um, theorems that tell you what properties of a kernel function tell you that, for example, is the, the sample spaces are going to be continuous. Uh, keyword there is the Kolmogorov continuity theorem, um, and then there's additions to that which essentially tell you whether samples are continuously differentiable. And you, you, this is just you know, from properties of the covariance function. Um, and then as soon as you actually know um, that your, your samples are going to be continuously differentiable, they're actually going to lie, or the sample space is, in a sense, going to work. You can think of the sample space as being that Banach space. Uh, if you want to read up on that, my paper actually has quite extensive. Uh, the samples of that are going to be smooth. There's papers that show that. And then, essentially, the RBF kernel's sample space is any CK space. And you're going to pick and practice the one that's interesting to you, right? If you need 20 derivatives, then you're going to pick C C20, essentially. That's kind of the idea. Um, yeah, then Sobolev spaces. I'm not sure whether anybody has heard even of a Sobolev space, but these things appear quite often in partial differential equations. And if you want to use a GP to infer the solution of a PDE, that's the space we kind of want to look at. Um, and then there's actually a notion of an RKHS that is going to be the sample space of a GP, but it's not the RKHS of the kernel. It's a, it's a systematic way of enlarging the RKHS of the kernel, um, which is called a power of an RKHS. Just to flash this at you, there is this, this notion, which sort of continuously grows the RKHS by, um, in these series representations, in these Mercer series representations, uh, introducing this theta power on top of the eigen, or the square root of the eigenvalue, rather, um, which then makes the space larger. So just to show you that. But now, unless there's any more questions about this, uh, Well, the, the, the reasoning is a bit the other way around, kind of. If you, if you know that you're going to observe derivatives of degree 20, then you have to find a kernel whose sample paths are actually going to lie in that space. That's the story. Well, you just know for some kernels that they, they produce these samples. It's, it's kind of a bit, a bit of a circular reasoning, but it's important to, to think about that, because otherwise, the operation of differentiating the process is obviously going to be ill-defined, right? So this is. And, and it, it actually has to be, so you th have to think about it for the sample space for it to make probabilistic sense, right? There, there's a bit more to that story, and there's quite some uh, references to it in some of these uh, references we gave in the lecture, um, if you want to read up on it. But it's mostly, you know, if you want to differentiate your probabilist or the, uh, the functions over which you have probabilistic belief, then that belief better, or the, the functions your belief is over better be differentiable, if that makes sense. Maybe one quick question. This you mean? That's kind of the idea. It's, so this is this informal type of argument here, because then um, if you remember from last lecture, there was that, that kind of informal argument that if you sum over the norm of a sample from essentially coming from the kahn leuve uh, transformation, then th that is going to be infinite. If you raise that to a certain power, then it might not be anymore. That's kind of the idea. But it's, it, there's more uh, rigor that needs to be sort of taken care of here, right? But, but. All right. So maybe let's come to something a bit more, more practical. Um,
So we've always been talking about that GP regression is, in a sense, relatively expensive, um, polynomially so, but, but still. Um, so what do we do? We have quite an expensive method. So it's, first of all, maybe quite interesting to look at why it's expensive. What, what is the, the actual operation that, that costs us this much? And then maybe think of some solutions of that. So this is what, it, what we're going to do today. And we're going to do this by sort of zooming in from a very, very high level into our uh, recurring implementation of a Gaussian process, this, this abstraction that Professor Hennig has been showing you. Um, yeah, and maybe localizing where things go, not necessarily wrong, but where things are expensive. So first of all, obviously the problem that we're uh, going to solve here is we want to learn a function from given set of finite set of input-output pairs, um, which is what we typically call a supervised machine learning, supervised regression problem. Um, and we, in this lecture, are particularly working on this using a Gaussian process model. Um, so we posit a Gaussian process prior over that function f with some given mean and covariance function. And then we model these, uh, this, this data set essentially as IID observations from um, that generative model. Um, and we, we, we use this technique of Bayesian inference to get a posterior uh, belief, posterior probability distribution over that unknown function f. Um, in code, for us, the sort of level uh, at which we're interfacing with, with this technique is this, right? We define a mean function. We define a kernel function, covariance function, if you ask me. <laughs> um, and then we define a prior quite generically by just passing it these two functions, which is li like, notice literally the thing we wrote on in, in the mathematics above, kind of. Um, and then we're conditioning on the data, um, which is, well, Bayesian inference in a nutshell in a couple, what, nine lines of code here. But notice that this code actually doesn't cost anything. If you look at this, we're defining functions. We're defining some object, um, which just uses these functions but never evaluates them. It's just storing them. And then we're conditioning on something. And if you actually look closely into the implementation of the condition function, it just takes these objects and stores them in a new object. So it doesn't really do anything. So this is not expensive. Where does the, the expensive stuff happen? Um, so maybe let's first go back a bit to the, uh, the mathematics of the Gaussian process to understand a bit better what we're, what we're actually implementing here. Um, so the posterior uh, Gaussian, well, first of all, the posterior uh, of a Gaussian process under some point, of, uh, point observations, essentially, some, some, some finite uh, observations from this, um, this GP is going to be another GP with said uh, mean function and, and covariance function, posterior covariance function. Um, and, well, here's the thing in, in sort of maths terms, uh, sorry, code terms. It's still quite, actually quite similar to um, the mathematics. There's a bit of magic happening, which we're going to get into um, in a second. But notice that this stuff also doesn't cost anything because we don't necessarily evaluate these functions yet. So again, where's the cost? Which is when we get into the numerics layer. So if we're actually evaluating the Gaussian process, so if you want to predict essentially what our posterior belief at a certain, at, at a certain set of observation points, or rather sort of prediction points, is we're going to call the mean and covariance functions, which are in turn going to um, call these uh, what are called cache properties. I think Professor Hennig already sort of explained what a cache property does. So. Uh, I don't really have to go over it, I guess, again. But, but notice that, um, first of all, here is what, um, and I'm not sure if you guys already talked about this, but um, here's where the memory cost comes in. So the first function evaluates the kernel function on all pair, uh, pairs of data points, and cons thus constructing the kernel matrix, which costs uh, n square memory, O of n square memory. And this is arguably the worst thing about a GP. Square, square memory cost is kind of bad, right? You can let an algorithm run longer, but it's difficult to sort of keep plugging in RAM sticks into your machine you're, you're working in because it's just going to eat up all your RAM. Um, so this is something we need to fix, and this is actually not necessarily the topic, uh, topic of today's lecture. Professor Hennig is going to talk about this, I think, next, uh, next lecture. 
but the main uh, cost uh, in terms of uh, computation is actually this line, where we're computing what's called Cholesky uh, decomposition of this predictive covariance. Um, yeah, and why would we do that? I'm not sure if all of you guys actually uh, talked about Cholesky uh, decompositions in their undergrads, so we're actually uh, briefly go over this now. So maybe hands up, who's heard of Gaussian elimination before? I kind of expected that, nice. Who's heard of LU or Cholesky decompositions or dealt with them? Okay, that's a bit less. Don't worry. I realize there's a bit of a wall of text, but we're going to chew through it quite slowly. So I expect most of you have seen Gaussian elimination before. So this is a technique for computationally solving a linear system. Um, I guess most of you guys have done this in high school. And the main idea is that, well, we start with a matrix A. Um, maybe ignore for now the, the, that index. And we're going to split off um, the, the first row of that matrix. We're, for, for now, we're going to leave that as, as it is. And then the idea of Gaussian elimination is to subtract that row from all successive rows in such a way that we get zeros in this first column. How do we do that? Well, we, we divide the entire row by alpha, and then before mul uh, adding it to the, uh, to the respective row, like the successive row, we're going to scale it by the magnitude of the, of the first entry in that row. And then if we add, rather, sub subtract the, 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 the two rows, we're going to get a zero here. Specifically, we can define, and this is sort of what I just said in vector notation, we can define this vector L, which essentially takes the, this, this entry B in the first column of or this, this, actually this lower left block here, so the, this, this column vector B, and divides it by, al by alpha, we're going to scale the, the, the row, may, uh, row vector U by that, and we're going to subtract it from this block. Why just this block? Well, because we know that's going to be 0, right? So the only non-trivial computation we actually have to do is in this block. And if we actually write this, this out, maybe before we, we even focus about this, this L and this U there, what we're doing is we're, we're taking this matrix alpha uh, U transpose B B, and then we're transforming it to the matrix alpha U transpose 0 vector, and then B minus what we defined there, L u transpose, right? So this is what we'll end up with. And now the idea is to repeat this process recursively on these blocks until we reach what's called a row echelon form, because we're assuming that the matrix is actually invertible here. This is just going to be an upper triangular matrix in the end if we repeat this process sort of recursively all the way down. Clear? Questions? All right. So the cool thing now is that um, we can actually invert these operations that we're doing on the matrix, you know, uh, essentially subtracting rows from one another um, by writing another matrix L in front of that matrix, um, which is also sort of um, constructed in a recursive way. And it turns out that this matrix L is going to be lower triangular. How do we see this? Well, first of all, and this is a recursive argument. At least the ones studying computer science know that to understand recursion, you have to understand recursion. So this is kind of always a bit of a difficult part here. Um, but let's assume, and this is what a recursive argument does, right? We can actually decompose a matrix of dimensions n minus 1 by n minus 1, which this is if the original matrix is n by n, right? Into lower, mat lower triangular matrix times upper triangular matrix. And the base case of this is, well, a one by one matrix, which this fulfills trivially, right? Um, so assume that we can actually write this matrix, which we call here um, a, um, a, a, a1 plus i. Um, assume that we can decompose L, a1, ah, sorry, i plus 1 as some lower triangular L i plus 1, upper triangular u 
i plus 1. And this upper triangular u i plus 1 just comes from this applying this Gaussian elimination procedure sort of all the way down. Um, and then we, we can plug this in here, this decomposition, and factorize again. And we'll see that um, this, uh, we essentially get this equation up there, right? So, so we get that A equals Li ui, where L and U use this L matrix and this U matrix we got from the version of this uh, for, for matrices of, of one dimension lower and then recombining terms. Don't worry if you didn't get all of that. Just sit down at home, go through the maths, and like, actually multiply the matrices out. You're going to figure it out. It's not that difficult. It's just you know there's terms flying around all the time. It's a bit uh, hand wavy, maybe. So there might be a problem with that. Who noticed that we did something which might cause problems, at least numerically? Yes, so we're dividing by that matrix alpha, and we don't know whether it's positive, right? Or, well, whether it's rather non-zero, but yeah. And we can actually show that um, if we repeat this process and maybe swap some rows, actually, um, to always pick the largest remaining uh, sort of leading value alpha here, which is called pivoting, then this process actually always works. So we're always dividing by a non-zero number, and we always get this decomposition. And this is kind of equivalent to, to um, A being invertible in this case. Um, computationally, uh, how much does it cost? Well, in, at least in leading order terms, computing these uh, outer products here costs um, in, in, iter uh, in iteration i, n minus i, because that matrix is going to be n minus i by n minus i products. And then we're going to subtract that from the original part of the matrix. So that's n minus i additions. Um, so essentially, we end up with 2 thirds n cubed if you actually do the math here. Um, the, so, so, so this is where that, that n cubed uh, runtime of matrix inversion actually comes from in the end. But what does it help us? Now, we didn't actually solve a linear system, but we just wrote our matrix as a product of two matrices. That seems like it makes it a bit more, more difficult, actually. But luckily, because these matrices actually have structure, again, wall of text, we're going to get through it. Um, because these matrices L and U actually have structure, we can invert them super cheaply. Namely, instead of n cubed, it's going to cost us n squared, which is the same as the cost of a matrix vector product, just to set that in a bit of context. So we now, if we computed this decomposition, can solve at the same cost as multiplying a matrix and a vector, or rather two matrix vector multiplications, which I'm going to show you in a bit. Maybe a question? To, to, the to leading order. It's not necessarily big O, because you want for the leading order term, you want the constant, kind of. That's the idea. Um, big O would discard that, right? So in big O, it's O of n cubed. And in, in this leading order notation, it's 2 thirds n cubed actually uh, flops, which we're going to see we can reduce. So we're recursively partitioning that matrix, right? Um, and at iteration i, that block is going to have size n minus i, essentially, right? In the first iteration, it's going to be n minus 1, because we split off first column, first row. Um, and because we're descending into that matrix now recursively, um, and we, we sort of need to subtract the outer product in every iteration, we're going to pay that at every iteration, if that makes sense. That's where it comes from. Um, right, so we now have this. Uh, the system AX equal B is now LUX equal B, because we now assume that we have this decomposition, um, which means that we can now solve two linear systems, namely LY equal B. And then if we know Y, we, sol we solve UX equal B. And then we get our um, solution X to the system. The nice thing about this is because L and U are um, lower and upper triangular respectively, we can use a technique called forward substitution and backward substitution now, which is much cheaper. And it's going to work like this. It's also one of these recursive things. So if we assume that we already know the solution, um, essentially in the first n minus 1 entries um, of the system, 
um, again, recursive argument. So you have to believe me that it's, it's possible to do that for smaller matrices here. Um, then we can take that solution and essentially what the argument that's now following is only possible because, because we have a zero in that block here. Um, and multiply it in and actually solve for uh, the unknown solution uh, gamma i in the last row now, because now we assume we know y, right? Um, so if we know uh, the y that fulfills l y equal b, then we can essentially multiply out l y and rearrange terms to arrive at this term here. Again, maybe sit down at home and actually go through the maths, right? So what's happening is that this is going to be y times l and gamma times lambda here, and then bringing everything other, uh, to the other side and dividing by lambda, we get this. Um, and then we can sort of update our solution to the smaller problem by appending that, that gamma to it. And if we do, do this recursively all the way down, here again, the base case is a scalar equation, right? Scalar times uh, y n minus 1, I guess, equal some scalar b, and that we just solve by division, and then we're done. Um, and this, as I said, costs quadratically in the number of rows and columns of the matrix, um, because what we're doing essentially here is an inner product between two vectors of length i in this, in this case uh, at, at every iteration. And yeah, then summing that up, we get n squared. All right. Um, so, so that means that once we actually have computed an LU decomposition, we can, we can sol uh, solve k linear systems in time what it costs us to compute the LU decomposition plus k times 2n squared. Um, and that's actually much cheaper than uh, computing an inverse as a matrix, so calling numpy.inv and then multiplying with that matrix, right? Because to actually get numpy.inv, what you're essentially doing is you're computing an LU decomposition, multiplying with all the canonical basis vectors, so the, essentially a diagonal matrix, the, the, the identity matrix, and that's going to cost you two over uh, two thirds n cubed plus two n cubed, so you're, you you actually get another essentially n cubed term in there, plus k n square because that's what it costs to multiply with the inverse matrix. So that's this is why people are telling you use a matrix decomposition and solve with it instead of um, like actually computing the inverse matrix and then multiplying with it because it's much cheaper. Um, and at the same time, it actually should be also more stable, um, numerically stable. Um, all right. So, but we actually are not using all of the structure in the matrix that we have because we know that our kernel matrix is symmetric and positive definite. And there's a specialized version of the LU decomposition called the Cholesky decomposition. You can convince yourselves essentially that the same argument that we just went through for LU decompositions holds for Cholesky decompositions, where now we sort of want to keep things symmetric. So that means instead of just leaving this factor alpha up here, we actually spread it to both factors, if that makes sense. So we, we take its square root, um, which is always going to be possible because of positive definiteness of the matrix. Um, and then the argument is essentially the same, just we're now careful to actually uh, keep up the um, symmetry so, such that the, the factors are actually just going to be transposes uh, of each other. So we essentially get just one factor that we need to compute, and then the upper triangular factor is going to be its transpose. Um, and you can convince yourselves, it's actually not too hard to do that, that this costs exactly half of what an LU decomposition costs us. So that's nice. We get a free uh, uh, factor of two speed up, essentially. Um, the interesting th thing here is that at least in exact arithmetic, this does not need pivoting. So we don't need to sw uh, swap rows and columns. Um, this is guaranteed to always be positive definite. And it's actually, there's, there's a theorem that says that this decomposition is in some sense unique um, uh, for, for every matrix. Um, yes. And it's still sometimes a good idea to actually do pivoting in practice. And we're actually going to talk about what pivoting means in the context of a Gaussian process, because there's a very specific implement, uh, interpretation of this. Maybe actually somebody already has an idea. What, what might that be? 
right? Let's see, maybe, maybe one slide later. Um, and that's going to improve the, the uh, stability of this algorithm because, well, we have round off errors. We, have, we are operating in finite precision on a computer. And so we actually need to, to uh, take some care here. Um, not a lot of people actually know that you can write the Cholesky decomposition as an iterative algorithm. So like just brushing over this very, very quickly, um, we are, what we're doing right here is essentially um, what we've been doing in the LU decomposition. We're at iteration i. We're taking the matrix that, uh, that we've been working with, and we're splitting off the ith column, dividing that ith column by its first entry. This is the, taking the alpha and dividing the, the b by the alpha from the, from the previous slides. And that's going to be this, this L vector. It's actually now appended by, by, by alpha in the, in the first entry, but don't worry about it. And then we're computing that, that rank one down date. So we're, we're subtracting from the matrix that we've been working on this outer product of, of the Ls, which, if you look at this, actually cancels out the first row, or well, not the first row, but rather the ith row and the ith column of that matrix. So it sets it to zero, which is exactly what we want to do here. And then um, we just add that L vector to the columns of like a, like a grow, essentially a growing, a, a matrix that becomes wider um, buffer in which we store this, this lower triangular L vector. Um, and in, in this sense, if you were to actually terminate this algorithm early, which is something you can do once you think about an iterative procedure rather than a recursive one, right? Um, you're actually building a low rank approximation to the matrix, which that's actually quite helpful because, well, you can invert these much quicker, right? We can just early terminate the algorithm and um, work with that factor. And this is something Professor Hennig is going to spend a lot of time talking about next week. So this is actually one of the approaches of speeding up, or methods like this are actually one of the, uh, one of the approaches of speeding up Gaussian process inference to subcubic uh, time complexity. Um, and sort of the graphic that I was, what I was talking about, you can see here, right? In iteration one, what you're doing is, well, A prime is A, so you're subtracting um, these vectors, which zero out first column, first row of the matrix, and then this gray part is the only thing that's sort of not yet zero, if that makes sense. And the L factor is just gonna be the outer product of two vectors, so it's a rank one approximation. And in the next, uh, next iteration, when we actually, what, we've, what we're doing here is we're now getting the second column of that matrix A, which is now, now this one, right? Then we get a zero in the first entry, so we keep up the, 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 the zeros in this L-shaped region here and sort of keep reducing that unexplored region in gray. And this is the, this is the picture you have, you have to have in mind here. Um, and this is actually also you, how you can see that actually the, the iteration i of this process only takes n minus i square um, operations, right? Because we, we, in a sense, and we didn't write this in the algorithm, but you can Im implement it more efficiently if you just operate in this region because everything else is just going to be zero anyways. All right. And OK, the, the other thing is um, this, this first step that we're doing here actually has to touch all the data points. And this is going to be important in a bit. Um, all right, so what we've seen here is that for the context of this lecture, training a learning machine, a Gaussian process, reduces um, in terms of computation to computing a matrix decomposition. And why do we do this? Well, it's essentially a way of amortizing the computations that we're doing. We're spending time computing that decomposition once, because afterwards, it's actually very, very cheap. Like once we have this structure, it's like an acceleration structure. It's very cheap to solve with the matrix and to do, one second, uh, to do prediction with a Gaussian process, actually. You need to, um, for the posterior covariance, you need to solve quite a lot of systems with that matrix, right? So it's nice that we can actually speed this computation up by quite a bit, but it still costs us cubically once. After that, all operations are quadratic. Um, and we've seen that this Cholesky decomposition, we, we didn't actually talk about stability, but the, the pivoted version of that Cholesky decomposition um, is a reasonably numerically stable approach um, of computing this decomposition numerically. Um, 
and once we have that, this amortization structure, things actually become a lot more cheap. But cubic complexity um, is quite bad, right? So it's, it's definitely not, not enough um, if, if we're in a big data setting. Um, but it doesn't mean that this comes from being Bayesian, and we're going to talk about this a bit uh, in the coming slides, I guess. But um, there's other reasons why we actually pay cubically here. There's ways to speed this up. Um, and maybe we can even wor work towards something that is, sort of, if you will, as expensive as deep learning. Because deep learning, and I guess more, more generally, um, regularized empirical risk minimization is often thought of as being, well, depends on who you ask, O of n, or maybe even O of 1 if you use batching and stochastic optimization, because that's actually going to then be independent, or the cost of that is then going to be independent of data set size. Um, yeah, and, and actually, so classical kernel ma machines, ridge regression, uh, is actually also in O of n, n cubed. Why is that? I'm going to answer this in the next couple of slides. That was a question. In code, you mean? Or? Yeah. So in let's maybe start in code and then go, go on to math. It's maybe, maybe a good idea. So what we're, what we're doing um, here is if, if we actually call, um, the, uh, for example, if we plot a Gaussian process posterior, or like con I think it's called a conditional Gaussian process object in this code, then what's going to be happening is at some point, the mean and covariance function are going to be called, right? And here, there's this object called representer weights. Um, and here, there's this Cho solve routine. Now, assuming that this predictive covariance Cho thing actually contains some representation of a Cholesky factor, this Cho solve thing does essentially two of these triangular solves um, in, in sequence, which is you know once forward substitution and once backward substitution, as we've seen uh, on the slides, um, to to actually essentially compute um, um, ah actually it's up there, this right here. So these two terms. There's one there's one inverse in there, and if we don't want to do prediction at let's say m points, which is you know, going to be then this, this uh, suck thing here, then we're solving implicitly m linear systems at cost, I have to think, m k, 2 m n squared here. And then there's going to be another matrix vector product with that, which is then also going to be m n squared, because we're contracting over the m, uh, n dimension, right? Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is w w where we use the Cholesky decomposition in the, in the covariance. And then in the mean, uh, this what's called representer weights here is essentially just a way of writing uh, this vector, right? So this, this is a vector, y minus mu x. So the, the, the product of y minus mu x with the inverse Gramian is going to be a vector again. And because this is going to be the same vector for every point at which we're going to be predicting, we can just cache that, right? So that we don't need to, uh, need, need to recompute it sort of for every prediction. And we call that representer weights because, um, did you guys already talk about kernel machines in SML now? OK, so th this is what it's called in SML. Don't worry about it. It's, it's just a name that, that uh, comes from this kernel ridge regression Yes, so essentially, it's, it, because it's the same matrix we're inverting, we, we get away with one decomposition. Um, there's one caveat, though, which is that if we want to sample from the posterior, we need the Cholesky decomposition of this entire well, the, 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 if, if we evaluate this at the test points, then we need to compute the Cholesky composition, decomposition of that again to sample, right? So that's a bit of a bummer. There's ways around this. There's, there's certain, um, yeah, I think it's mostly approximate schemes that, that sort of 
help you get away with just this one matrix inverse, but that's then also going to be dependent on the kernel. So that's a bit more complicated story, I guess. Um, and also sometimes for sampling, specifically um, from, the, from, from the posterior, because that might collapse, right? There might be zero eigenvalues in the matrix. It's sometimes actually better to use a, uh, like a symmetric matrix square root, or uh, which then you, you typically do by an, by an SVD. Uh, so that's, that's a bit of a different story, which we didn't really go through here. But yeah, and then these are essentially the routines that, that compute and cache these, these quantities, right? So here's the Cho factor computes the Cho SQ. Another question? Sorry, okay. Yes. So you mean if you, if you sort of have data arriving in an online fashion? Yes, this is going to be this week's exercise sheet. So I'm not going to say too much about that. The idea is that there's versions of this Cholesky decomposition that um, help you reuse the Cholesky decomposition of existing blocks and then update that of a, of a bigger matrix, right? So in, in a sense, if you have a matrix and you append sort of three blocks to it, right? then you can update the Cholesky decomposition of the original block um, at cheaper cost than O of n squared, where n is now the dimension of the larger matrix. Um, and that, that is how you, I guess, most elegantly implement uh, like online versions of Gaussian, Gaussian process conditioning where, uh, well, actually, to be honest, like, again, because, because instantiating a Gaussian process, and particularly also a posterior Gaussian process, doesn't cost anything, you're only really going to run into this, this problem if you want to condition on a batch of data, then evaluate, and then, then there's more data coming. Because otherwise, you can just you know, concatenate the data sets and then evaluate afterwards. Because you know, just instantiating doesn't cost you anything. So it depends a bit on what the actual scenario is there. Yeah, this is, this is how you get to it sort of. Um, uh, mathematically, I would say, like wh why this works, but then the linear algebra is actually different because it's, it's actually more efficient that way. All right. More questions? Yeah, but the story is a bit more difficult there because um, essentially you can rewrite the trace as different sort of linear combinations of the eigenvalues, right? And because you're actually not operating an eigenbasis here, um, that won't be the case for, in general at least, for the Cholesky decomposition. But I think it's a good sort of mental, um, mental picture to have in mind that you're trying to find directions in which the matrix sort of spans this, this, this ellipsoid you're typically thinking about when you're, when you're thinking about a matrix, yeah. And then for specifically for, for, Chile, uh, for LU, there's uh, also two pivotings you can um, apply, right? There's, there's you, can, you can permute rows and you can permute columns. And if you just, I think if you just permute rows, then it's called partial pivoting. And the, the most, I think the most stable variants actually do both, um, such that you never actually run into cancel, or well, you do run into cancellation issues, but you're mitigating them um, as far as you can. Kind of. that, that is actually the point I wanted to allude to earlier. So, so having seen that Cholesky, and actually you can do the same thing with, uh, with LU2, I think it's called the, like the outer product version of the algorithm. Um, you can early stop this, of course. And, and, but now the question is, in, in the context of, of um, GP regression, um, you kind of want pivoting, right? Because if you, like for example, if you condition, if, if your data lies in a lint space, right? So, so essentially the order of the data points in the matrix corresponds to them being close to one another, 
you don't necessarily want to walk over that data set in, in that order, because when you've already conditioned on, on a data point at some place, you're obviously going to learn more, and that depends on the kernel also, but let, let, let's talk about stationary kernels for now, which have sort of a local impact on the function. Then um, the points that are farther away from the data points you've already seen grant you more information about the, the, the unknown function, right? So it's actually a good idea to either have pivoting, which tries to find an order of the data points, which is, that's kind of what I was alluding to, what pivoting means in the context of Gaussian process regression, um, that, well, orders them in such a way that at each step you're, you're getting the most, like, let's say, informally speaking, information gain uh, from, from your data points. Uh, yeah, and that is something, again, Professor Hennig is going to talk about a lot next week. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I forgot that. So the, qu the question was here um, about pivoting, um, whether pivoting has something to do with trying to find um, or sort of eliminate the largest eigenvalues first. And the answer to that is, well, the, the pivots, so the, essentially these diagonal entries that you're working with, don't necessarily have anything to do with the eigenvalues in this case, because the, these L vectors aren't necessarily the eigen vectors, right? So, so that's why, that, um, yeah, they're not the same. All right, let's take a quick break. I'm actually gonna be around if there's any questions uh, about last week's lecture or anything we've talked about today, so drop by. I'm also here after the lecture. All right, so I just got a really good question, actually, that I should have mentioned, I think, on this slide, um, which is, um, why is this O of n, respectively, O of 1? Um, because, well, there's going to be, in each iteration of, of uh, say, SGD, there's going to be a huge network that needs to be evaluated and uh, differentiated through. But this is just to look at how the method scales with data. This is O notation, right? So if we assume we, we, we take a network, um, independent of the, of the number of data points that we actually have and fix that size of the network, then it's going to be O of 1. But otherwise, this would be something like O of however much it costs to evaluate the forward and backward paths of a neural network. It's as simple as that. Question? I don't quite understand the point. If I never look at the data, so if I don't look at my end data point, yeah. so what is the method that I have? Well, I mean, a lot of models are actually trained without even doing one epoch, right? So th there is definitely a point to be had there, right? But, but uh, th this is the sort of, like, we're reflecting the current practice, uh, kind of. And, and this is arguably also where this distinction comes from, right? The, well, one iteration costs you essentially O of 1, so K iteration costs you something like O of K, which is still O of 1, but arguably shouldn't, and, and the, well, we don't quite know all that much about, uh, about how deep learning models train, right? But th th there is, in, in a certain sense, you'd expect that O of 1 to actually scale with the number of data points, because, well, arguably you could have just also looked at one data point and then it's going to be in the same uh, uh, computational cost class here. So this is why, depending on who you ask, I think you get different, a different answers for that. But if we, if we assume that we maybe go through the data set once, then it's all fine, right? Okay, so maybe um, to actually show you guys what I mean when I say deep learning, when I, when I say, um, what, I say, what I mean is, is essentially regularized uh, empirical risk minimization um, to find the weights of some neural network where we have some, uh, per element loss function, uh, lowercase l here, um, some, some regularizer that just depends on the weights. Um, this decomposes into a sum over the um, training data points. Um, and typically, right, in deep learning, I guess most of you already did take the deep learning lecture last semester. Um, what you typically do is you, you um, use a stochastic first order optimizer so you're not actually optimizing this loss function, but you're drawing um, B examples from your data set and then computing that expectation 
um, and well, particularly also its gradient uh, on that on that batch, and that means that this this what's called the mini batch gradient GW or G of W uh, is actually a random variable, um, and well, that random variable is depending on how you draw the data points from the from the training set, a better or worse, maybe sometimes unbiased, sometimes not unbiased estimator of the true gradient, but it's still quite noisy, um, and well, this is also where that O of 1 comes from, right? Because, because now the sum doesn't scale with the number of data points, and it's just O of B, uh, where B is the batch size. Um, so each iteration is largely independent of N, but then we might need a larger number of them. So I guess compute cost, debatable. Um, all right, now let's answer, answer the question how GPs actually fit into all of this. And in the last lecture, we, we already set the groundwork, I guess, when we noticed that um, the posterior mean of a Gaussian process is actually related to that regularized empirical risk minimization problem. Here, I'm using a bit of a different approach to it. I'm not using exactly the kernel ridge estimate uh, because that's going to like, involve some theory that you will go through in statistical machine learning, but we don't have access to yet. So let's actually go a bit of a simplified route and note that we know that the posterior mean evaluated at some finite data set X um, is going to be a Gaussian because, well, the posterior uh, process is going to be a Gaussian process, so evaluating it is a Gaussian uh, random variable. And its mean is also the mode of that posterior distribution over the process evaluated at the training points given the data. Because for a Gaussian, mean and mode coincide, right? And if we write that down, essentially, so we, we, we say that um, the, the mean, the posterior mean at the training points is essentially the max of the log posterior density over whatever values the process takes at those points. Um, which by Bayes' rule is the sum of uh, log prior and log, uh, sorry, log uh, likelihood and log prior plus some constant term, which doesn't matter because we're just considering the argmax, right? Um, flipping signs, we get a min instead of a max here. And then if we actually expand these terms, because we know both of these are going to be Gaussian, we get this. And let's actually compare to what we've seen on the previous slide. First of all, we have a term that um, expands into a sum over data points, essentially. So these are the individual per example losses um, that, we, that we incur. Um, or the, the, these are, not the, but these are in, uh, individual per example losses that we incur for every data point. And then we have something that just depends on the weights of the model and some parameters, I guess. And this you can see as a regularizer. Particularly, this is like, an, like a squared KXX inverse norm, so a norm weighted by the inverse kernel matrix, um, an L2 norm weighted by the, by, by, the, um, by the inverse kernel matrix, which would be, if that thing were diagonal, that would just be an L2 regularizer. So it's related to that. Uh, there was a question here. Everything good? OK. Um, and then. This one, you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, we're, we're assuming additive Gaussian observation noise with, with independent measurement noise oh, sigma squared. And that's, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Gaussian with mean F, Fx and covariance diagonal scale or, or identity scaled with uh, sigma squared, exactly. And this is also where this term comes from, right? This is why it factorizes over. Uh, or sorry, why, well, why, why the p factorizes and why we get a sum in the log density. Make sense? Everybody on board? All right, nice. Um, now, notice that we're actually just, uh, s s well, OK, so first of all, we, we now have, um, s s I guess, successfully cast at least an aspect of Bayesian reasoning into an optimization problem which is sort of the first step if we, that, that we need to take by um, comparing the two, I guess, right? Because, because, well, deep learning solves an optimization problem, so 
obviously, a Gaussian process, in a sense, also solves an optimization problem on the way by different means, but it does so. Um, second thing, note that this is actually just the mean of the, the posterior mean of the, of the uh, well, the, of the unknown function evaluated at the data points. But because we have some conditional independence in our model, and if you write that down, it's actually not too hard to see that if you actually know f of x, then the data are independent of all the prediction points. And we can use that um, to given the, well, actually, we need the posterior mean and uh, I think the, yeah, the posterior um, covariance at the data points. But you can get that in, this, I guess, in the regular way. Um, you can predict um, onto new unseen points by essentially this formula here. Um, and not sure if I actually want to go over this. So this is also in Rasmus and Williams. It's not too important. It's just to show you that this is possible. If you just solve that one optimization problem, you can still access the full posterior um, if, you, if, you, if you then also compute the KXX. OK, so that means that we can, in a sense, train a Gaussian process by solving um, a quadratic optimization problem, so a least squares problem with L, uh, quadratic regularizer, yeah? So the idea here is that um, if you write down um, did, did you guys talk about conditional independence in the lecture before? I guess so, right? Um, so the idea here is that Sec. Sorry, the question was uh, what that argument about conditional independence was. If you have some Gaussian process prior f, then what we're doing here is we're evaluating the process at some data points, right? And um, by adding Gaussian noise to that, independent Gaussian noise to that, we derive another random variable, y, so the observations, whose value we observe in the end. And what we want to do now is we want to predict at previously unseen points, f star, or did we call it? Yeah, fx star, rather. Right? So if we know this node, so if we, if we assume that this is given, then there's a, there's a chain as a part of this, this graph. And so this, because essentially this chain is blocked by knowing this, this node, we don't have any, um, any, or we get conditional independence of this from this. Uh, not sure if you guys talked about this, like how to, how to reason in these graphical models before, but that's the, that's the argument here. Um, as I said, there is a section about this in Rasmus and Williams, if you want to read up on it uh, a bit more. It's just like, don't worry about it too much uh, if, you, if you didn't get everything that I was saying here. Um, it's just to, to argue why it actually suffices to solve the optimization at the training data. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much the argument here. wait a couple of slides. So the question was how you actually get the entire uncertainty, if, because what we're doing here is just we find the mode, right? The, the, the map estimate. Exactly. And we're going to talk about this in a couple of slides. It's, it's going to be a complicated story. Let's, let's put it like this. Not complicated in the sense of the math is complicated. It's just it's not as easy uh, to get to a satisfying answer, maybe. OK. Um, OK, so and then there's a bit of a problem here now, because um, if you look closely, fx is going to be, a, you can think of it as a vector of weights or parameters in Rn. So this is actually going to be at least O of n to solve this optimization problem. Because, well, that's our, um, the cost of evaluating our model, essentially. So the number of weights in our model always is going to scale with the number of data points that we're looking at. But that's not a problem of being probabilistic. The, exactly the same problem you also occur in kernel ridge regression. This is rather 
um, due to the fact that we're working with a non-parametric model. So, you know, like an infinitely wide neural network, if you want to think about it this way. Um, because we actually have no finite dimensional representation of the model. That was the entire point of deriving a Gaussian process, that we can actually somewhat efficiently work with infinite numbers of features, um, but still get finite computation times in the end. Um, and so if we take a non-parametric frequentist model, like kernel rich regression with suitably chosen kernels, we actually just incur the same problem. So it's not the cost of being Bayesian that makes GP regression necessarily uh, costly, but it's the fact that, well, it's non-parametric, right? And possible ways around this is, well, we can just use a parametric model again, of course. We can just choose a kernel that is constructed from finitely many features, and then we can cast this optimization problem entirely in weight space and essentially arrive at the same cost as a deep learning model. Um, and this is also what people, at least in one branch of Bayesian deep learning do, and I think uh, Philip is gonna talk about this uh, for quite a substantial part of the coming uh, lectures. Um, but for now, let's actually stick to the non-parametric model because, well, that's the more general case and you can always cast it as a feature-based model. There are actually quite a, quite a lot of approximation methods to mitigate particularly that problem that have been constructed in the literature. Um, sparse GP regression and inducing point methods are sort of very well-known um, approaches there. You can also use structure in the matrices. There's all sorts of things. But for now, let's just you know, keep it very simple and, and accept that we have to deal with n parameters because maybe you can convince yourself that you can rid of, get, get rid of this as soon as you sort of switch to a finite dimensional representation of the model. Um, yeah, so now that we have this loss function, what we typically do is, well, we use an optimizer and we use first order um, gradient-based optimization methods, so we actually need a gradient of this. Um, implementing this loss directly, like evaluating that function, you can see already, would also take O of n cubed, because you have an inverse of the kernel matrix in here. Um, we, ha we can sort of employ a bit of a trick here um, and note that we, on paper, can actually write down the solution to this optimization problem, and it's just gonna be the posterior mean of the Gaussian process, and then the bullet is just gonna be, in this case, also capital X, right? So we can actually see that there is a vector alpha that in code we call the representer weights, and you're gonna see in SML in a couple of weeks, I guess, why, um, which just encompasses this inverse times uh, the, the sort of mean adjusted data um, or centered data, um, and we can now do a change of coordinates in the optimization problem, essentially rewrite everything in here, so, so essentially substitute um, fx by um, this one up there, k, or rather mu x, plus, and this is all the capital X, sorry, KXX alpha, and if you do that, you arrive at this optimization problem, just, you know, changing, changing variables. Now our loss function is not a function of FX anymore, but a function of alpha, so we optimize over alpha. Note that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence if we assume K to be invertible, so for every alpha there's gonna be an FX and the other way around, so we can actually do this in a, in a sensible manner. Um, and then this is the loss function we're gonna get. Um, in this form, it's still actually not evaluable because you have that inverse in there. Um, but if you multiply out this quadratic, then you just arrive at a very simple loss function, quadratic and alpha, which doesn't invo in involve any matrix inverses. And computing, so, so this one we can actually evaluate because that constant part is gonna, so, so essentially the inverses are gonna disappear in a constant part because they don't actually depend on alpha. So for optimizing this loss function, we don't need to care about them. And then in the gradient, obviously, they also disappear. So you can either see this as we use this loss function and don't have access to the loss function itself, but we can access the gradient because, well, these nasty terms disappear in the gradient, 
Or you can see it as we rewrite the loss function and then there's none of these terms in there anymore. Questions? Oh, sorry, yeah. So this is the gradient. Um, and that should be like clearly um, or pretty straightforward to derive here. Um, yeah, and then let's actually implement this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna need, yeah. Sorry? And, sorry, yeah, I didn't answer that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. How could you basically set error like this? Like, I, I understand that the property you want, why have that problem? Then how do you then go from that step to this step? You mean from the, 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 the upper one to, the, to this one? Yeah. Just, okay, so. Mm, do I have time to do this? Maybe let, let's try to do it at the end. The idea is. You, you, you substitute fx equals this term for every occurrence of fx in the, in the loss function of the original uh, optimization problem, and then collect a bunch of terms. Just multiply everything out and realize that a sum over independent data points there can actually be written as a similar quadratic form uh, with a diagonal matrix in the middle. That's the idea. And this is actually why, the, why we get the, um, the sigma squared uh, identity matrix here. So this is where that comes from. I didn't understand how we went back to the analytic optimum. And then from the analytic optimum, we now go back to the analytic optimum. Yeah, so essentially the idea is that if you knew this solution of this linear system, then you would know the mean, right? And the only thing that's unknown here is gonna be this, this well, it's pr precisely the solution, which is a vector alpha, right? So, so we don't know alpha, but we, we know that the solution has this sort of, if you will, like a functional form if you knew alpha. So we can substitute that in here. It, the idea is kind of to solve the, the, the optimization problem partially um, and then reformulate it as the, op the sort of the task of the optimization problem is to find the optimal alpha. Yeah, but it's costly. So we don't actually want to call an inverse. We want to solve this by gradient descent. We want to essentially treat the GP as a, as a neural network, if you will. So if that makes sense. Is that clear to anyone? So, sorry, the question was where, where does the alpha come from? More questions about this? You mean this one? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what was the question? So, yeah, sorry. So fx is, is just the value that essentially mu x takes, right? So it's just a, a shorthand name for it. It's just some, some symbol. Um, and we want to optimize over that. And yeah, so mu x is the, the sort of, tr uh, if, if, the, if the bullet were the capital X, the training data set, then mu x or the optimal choice for fx would be mu x. The mode of the um, sort of point evaluated posterior is the same as the mean of the point evaluated posterior. It's a Gaussian. Yeah. That's the idea. All right, let me quickly switch to code now. Okay, so we're using essentially the same method that we've been using before. Uh, sorry, uh, model we've been using before. We use a zero mean. Uh, Gaussian process with a matern five, uh, five halves kernel. Um, and the data that we're gonna use, because we want to have some control over where the data points actually lie, is just gonna be generated on model. So we, we draw a function from that prior, and we add noise to finitely many evaluations from that prior, and then that's gonna be our training data set. So the model should ideally be able to recover the data perfectly because we're, we're using the same generative process to recover the data that we've, been used, uh, that, that we've been using to generate it. And we can now just have something to compare to actually compute the posterior enclosed form, which is kind of what we want to be avoiding, but we also need to know what we're targeting, right? Um, and then that's going to look like this. Um, just 
standard Gaussian process posterior, I guess. Uh, you can also see the data points, and actually, I, I would say, matches the, the data quite nicely, um, which is good. But now, um, recall that this is going to be expensive, right? Cubically expensive in the number of data points. And we, uh, what we wanted to do is, is uh, solve it by gradient descent. So let's actually do that. What do we need for gradient descent? Well, we need a gradient of the objective function. Um, and that is going to be this term. So it's the, it's the Gramian kernel matrix evaluated at, the, at both sides of the, at the, at the training points. Plus, and this is actually happening up here, a diagonal matrix scaled by the, the observation, the variance of the observation noise. Um, and then we also need the prior um, mean evaluated training points. That's just going to be a zero array in this case. But obviously, you know, this code generalizes that. And then we have the, this alpha vector and the data points. So the gradient depends on the alpha vector, which we now try to optimize for, and the data points. Um, and then having found an alpha, the model, which is to say, in this case, the um, the prediction uh, at some point lowercase x, um, given the training data at x, the posterior mean here, is just going to be a linear projection of that alpha we learned by optimization um, through this kernel matrix plus the prior mean. Again, this is zero, so this is fine. OK, so let's start by initializing alpha. We, we need to uh, initialize our, our parameters. Uh, for now, we're going to choose zero here. Um, yeah, and then evaluating the gradient is just as simple as evaluating that function. And obviously, we could have also just like implemented the loss function and used auto diff. But depending on which loss function we use, that would have been quite costly. We we could have used the last function, but here the gradient is actually su uh, super simple, so we just implement it by hand, right? Um, and then we train a Gaussian process by gradient descent. We define a learning rate. We define a number of epochs. Note that actually every gradient step is in a sense, it depends a bit on how you actually define it is an epoch here, because we actually have to use, because we have n parameters, have to use the entire um, data set. So technically, it's not stochastic gradient descent that we're using here, but rather like actual gradient descent. Um, and the fact that we call SGD here is just because it's, well, readily available, I guess. Um, but yeah, so we initialize and we iterate the typical gradient descent equations, well, it's kind of abstracted away here. We could also use another optimizer, but yeah, um, what this does is gradient descent actually without a line search with a fixed um, learning rate. And then what we get is this right here. So this um, dashed red line is the true posterior mean that we t try to target. And the green line is the estimate we get by gradient descent. This is the loss curve we get. It's super smooth because it's not a stochastic optimizer obviously. Um, it's maybe not even done training yet, but eh, don't worry about it. Yeah. So we've, in a very vague sense, maybe trained a, a Gaussian process by gradient descent now. Questions? So uh, Yeah. So, so the, you mean the training data. So the question was whether we, we're sampling the training data from the same distribution, as, as, rather the prior, actually. Yeah. So that, that means the model is uh, the, the data is sort of on model. Um, you could also use other data. It's just so we can control where the training data points actually lie. But, but this is a different question, right? This is a que so the question was whether it, whether it would look like this if we used a different model for generating the data, if I understood correctly. And of course it wouldn't, but that doesn't, that's not a question of whether we train a GP with gradient descent or not. It's rather a question of model mismatch. And that, that's something, uh, yeah, a, a regular Gaussian process, like the, essentially the, the thing we saw um, before, would also have issues with. Because, well, there should be the same thing, right? The, the posterior mean should be the same thing as the posterior mode, kind of. All right, so what's the problem with this? Why don't we just always train GPs by gradient descent? Maybe it doesn't provide any advantage. Yeah, that's one argument. So for, if, we, if we use a matrix uh, inverse, uh, 
it's going to cost us quite a bit, but we know once we actually compute it, we are done. This is the solution. With an optimizer, you approach the solution, but maybe you don't actually reach it to arbitrary precision. I'm kind of going to come back to that in a second. Hmm? Sorry, I can't understand what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So we don't have an estimate of the uncertainty. That's essentially what you were saying, yeah. OK, and this is something, let's try to go over this in the last five minutes or so. Um, so yeah, obviously, we don't have uncertainty. So maybe taking that away. So what could we do? Throw, throw me some ideas. Yeah, that's an, that's an idea. You probably, because the problem is actually convex, will get very similar results. So maybe that doesn't work too well. But sort of by using different learning rates and terminating early, that might be an idea, yeah? Something you've actually already seen in the lecture is maybe, huh? Exactly. A Laplace approximation might be an idea. You've kind of already seen that, I guess. Uh, Laplace approximation is actually going to be exact in this case, because, well, we are approximating a Gaussian with a Gaussian, kind of. Um, and we can just do that. The mass is literally the same thing you've already seen. You, you take this loss function that we've been working with. You take the gradient. You take the Jacobian of the gradient, which is the Hessian. Um, and you can see that this is, well, this. And that means that the posterior um, covariance is going to be the inverse of, well, the inverse of the negative of that, rather. Um, and that's literally. What you, would, what, what you would expect. Um, it's bit, maybe a bit difficult to see. You'd have, you have to use the, so this is the precision form of the, of the posterior covariance. So you, to actually get the covariance, you need to use the matrix inversion lemma ones. You've already had that on a, on a previous slide. But we still need to compute an inverse now, right? This is maybe not super satisfactory. So another approach, and I'm going to go over this very quickly and ask Philip to go over it uh, another time next week, maybe, is we can work with uh, something called, or that you could call, I guess, the sensitivity of the minimizer with respect to the data. So we look at the minimizer of that optimization problem, and we're going to notice that, well, we can solve this in closed form, not computationally, maybe, because it's expensive. Um, but well, the, 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 the analytic form of that, that solution is going to be just the solution of this linear system. And then let's note that the derivative, so the Jacobian of this expression with respect to y, is just that matrix. So if we had a means of differentiating the solution of an optimization problem with respect to the training data, which it obviously depends on, then we can just use that matrix and uh, which is actually, in this case, the inverse Gramian, and replace it um, in all computations that use it. Have you got any ideas how to differentiate the solution of an optimization problem with respect to the parameters? There's two very, well, one obvious way and one bit more involved way. Yeah, maybe? You mean like a finite difference approximation? Yeah, that's an option. Actually, I didn't think of that. That's a good point. You could maybe do that. I, I didn't think this through. Maybe that, that's actually something, if you want to try it, try it. It's interesting. Um, so the, I guess the obvious thing is, you know, gradient descent is actually just a string of computations, which are so the, the unrolled cause of gradient descent, like doing successive updates. That is actually differentiable. So you could theoretically just differentiate through the gradient descent steps of your optimizer, because that, that is going to span a computation tree. It's going to be super expensive if you do many steps. But that is a way to get at this. Maybe the, the fact that this is going to be quite expensive and actually also quite unstable shows you that it's maybe not the best idea to actually do that. The other thing is something called implicit differentiation. Um, you can read up on this. Not super important. Um, Never mind if you're not interested in that. But point being, if you use implicit differentiation, you also end up inverting an n by n matrix. So 
nothing gained there. So these are the two, I would say, standard approaches to differentiating minima of, of something, uh, by the way. Um, but actually, instead of just differentiating through the whole unrolled graph, we can just approximate by just differentiating with respect to the last step the optimizer took, right? So this is gonna be, and I realize I'm a bit short on time. So let's maybe make this the last thing we actually talk about. Um, the last step, the gradient, is, so assume we make, we make n steps, right? So in the, in the nth iteration, we arrive at some alpha n estimate. And if we do gradient descent, then that is gonna be the alpha n minus first estimate minus the learning rate, or I guess eta is often used there, um, times the gradient of um, the, the loss, well, sorry, gradient of the loss function at the previous estimate. And now truncating that, um, that thing after one iteration means we assume that, and this is obviously an approximation, that alpha n minus one does not depend on the training data, but we know that the gradient depends on the training data. So we can just differentiate this expression once with respect to the y, which actually sort of enters inside the, the, the loss or the gradient of the loss computation. It's an approximation, of course, so it's gonna be of, of questionable, um, I guess questionable validity here, but if we do that and essentially use the formula or a bit of a modified version for stability than the one I showed on the slides, then we end up with this. Um, it looks like it's approximating the uncertainty reasonably nicely, actually, but if you actually look at the sensitivity, so this, great, this Jacobian, it's just gonna be a diagonal matrix, which comes from the specific form of the update. And maybe that already tells you that this approximation is kind of bad, actually. But it's maybe a place to start, and we're gonna go over similar things in a bit. Let me just summarize real quickly, and questions we can talk about after the lecture, maybe, quickly. Um, so, exactly, we, get, we still get at least, and at least because the gradient descent might actually take loads of steps, right, uh, n cubed time for this, because we end up doing something at least as costly as inverting a system, or actually inverting a system in both cases. So the story isn't quite told here, and we're gonna elaborate on f better ideas to actually approximate this in further lectures. All right. We've seen today that instantiating a Gaussian process model doesn't cost you anything because it's this lazy functional object which you don't actually need access to any, any data. We can train a Gaussian process just as we can train a neural network or some other uh, problem that requires risk minimization by Gradient descent SGD, the, the S in GD here is debatable still. Um, we can make point predictions, so we can do inference at test time in O of N. Um, but we haven't really figured out how to get sensible posterior covariance estimates. So we, we don't quite know how to do this gradient descent trick and figure out how to get sensible posteriors um, yet. And this is gonna be um, the topic of coming lectures or the coming lecture, rather. With that, I'm pretty much done. Thanks, guys, and see you in the lecture.